Greetings and welcome to today's 10 minute painting lesson. We're going to begin here as we generally do with our large damp square headed brush. Here I'm applying a bit of titanium white to the area in which I want my sky to be applied and where I want my lake slash river to also be applied. Then I'm going to go back to my palette, grab a little bit of primary blue and begin applying this to the top of the sky. Then I'm going to begin blending down slowly. The goal here is to get the top of the sky fairly blue and the bottom of the sky, the area closest to the horizon, to remain fairly white. I want a transition and gradient from the two and I want it to look like it gets brighter and brighter as we move towards the distance. I'm also going to do a reflection of this down in the water area, which means we need to make the bottom portion of the canvas blue and then allow it to get more white as we move up into that center area. The goal here is to render a very smooth transition from one to the other. This is best achieved with a little bit of water and a very soft application of your brush. Then I'm going to switch over to an old square headed brush, one where the bristles kind of leaf off in varying directions. So when you make a dabbing motion with it, you render a litany of different implications. And here I'm using a pink, which is really just a mixture of titanium white and a primary red. And I'm beginning at that horizon, I'm making it very small. And then as we get closer to us on the right and left hand side, I'm allowing it to grow larger and larger. I'm also rotating the brush in the air in between each dabbing motion to ensure that the application is always changing. So the trees look like they're always evolving. It looks much more natural in that manner. Then I'm grabbing more primary red and I'm applying that to the center areas. The idea here is that the blue sky is reflecting and working through the tops of the leaves and the bottoms of the trees are much more dense. So you get more of their natural color. It isn't blending as much with the primary blue and titanium white in the sky, which is also why you'll get much more of a natural red because it isn't blending with the white which we previously applied. Then I'm going to go back to my palette. I'm grabbing a mixture of a lot of primary yellow and a little bit of primary red. It's going to render a bit of an orange. And now I'm going to use this pigment instead. And I want them to kind of gradually work from one into the other, but I still want them to look like they can be their own sets of trees. I'm applying these in the same way that I did our initial application. It's in this litany of different dabbing motions. And as you can see, it's rendering a couple of different things, a couple of different colors, which is good because it makes our forest look a little bit more diverse and interesting. When it mixes with the red, you get more of a warmer orange. When it mixes with the sky blue and the water, you get more of a green. So you get this eclectic mix of colors that really all lend themselves well to this fall landscape here. Now, it's worth noting that the primary yellow is a very thin pigment, so you might have to go back and do this a couple of times. Some colors, some pigments are much more thick than others, and if you feel that you really need to thicken up a pigment because you're just not getting a thick enough layer and you're seeing the color underneath it too much, then I'd simply implore you to incorporate a little bit of additional titanium white as it is quite thick. Then I'm moving back to my primary red and I'm working this around our orange application. I'm trying to get it so that middle portion of our trees, the area that's going to divide the land and the water, is much more dark. So here I'm even incorporating a little bit of a burnt umber as well, just into that real crevice area. And we will divide these two sections, the sky and the water, the trees and the reflections of trees. But we need to wait just a little bit for this to dry so that it doesn't look a little bit messy. That's something you need to recognize when working with acrylics. You don't always have to work wet into wet. You can easily work wet into dry because it does dry so quickly. It's one of the real benefits of working with this. It's also great because if you mess up on something, all you have to do is wait five minutes and then you can paint over it and it should be just fine. Now here I'm going back in and I'm incorporating a little bit of additional green. I didn't want a lot of green because it is a fall painting, but a little bit can really add some additional life to the painting, right? The more colors generally, the better. 
Then I'm going to switch over to my medium sized square headed brush. Here I'm taking some titanium white paint and I'm drawing this dividing line between our trees and our reflections of trees. Then I'm kind of dragging the pigment out in this kind of Z like pattern as you can see. It's going to blend a lot of the colors that we have and it's really going to look like a reflection, like a reflection in moving water. If you want your water to look much more stagnant, much more or crystal clear, then you probably shouldn't incorporate too much of this. But if you really want it to look like water and be noticeable almost instantaneously, then a lot of this technique can really be advantageous to your work. Now we just passed the five minute point and I think it's coming along quite well. We're going to let that dry before we work in any of the branches and trunks. And while we do that, we're going to switch over to the smaller round headed brush. Here I'm using titanium white and I'm just drawing in some clouds. There's a good amount of water on my brush to ensure that my clouds are fairly transparent and we're using the smaller round headed brush because it innately has fairly round edges which are fantastic for rendering subjects which also have fairly round soft edges. If I want to render something like a tree or a rock, something very sharp, I'll use a square headed brush because it does have a sharp edge. But if I want to render something much more soft like clouds or mist, I'll use more of a round headed brush. So just try to be cognizant of which type of brush you're using in each scenario and which one might be the most advantageous for that scenario. Now here I'm also working the reflection of the clouds down into the water and I'm trying to work my way around all of the previously applied applications. It can be a little bit difficult sometimes, but you know what? It's not really the biggest deal because it is a reflection. It is moving water. If it's a little bit off, I really wouldn't worry about it. Then what I'm going to do is switch over to my smaller square headed brush. I'm going to grab some burnt umber and I'm going to begin working in our trees and the real bases of them, the trunks. And this is something that generally we start with. However, I think in this lesson, it was kind of fun to work backwards to do the foliage first and then do it this way. Because in painting, there are really 150 ways to, to do most everything. And it's all about finding the way you like, finding your preference. So that's what we're doing right here. I'm trying to ensure that the trees that are closest to us are much larger, they have a lot more width, and the trees that are farther away get smaller and smaller because that's how perspective works and it'll add a lot of depth into your painting. It's also worth noting that the trees that are much more in the foreground are going to be much more brown. They're going to have a lot more of a burnt umber. Whereas the trees that are farther away are going to be much more transparent. They'll adopt the colors that are around them much more. And that's happening because they have all of the reflective colors around them and they're kind of optically blending together the farther away they get. So you want this progression where in the foreground you get the innate coloring of the subject and as you move into the background you get it to have more of this reflective color and something that blends much more so with the rest of the painting. This can generally be achieved by just allowing the brush and the pigment to run out as you work backwards in the painting or you can add a little bit of additional water to your brush to thin the paint so that when you apply it, you still see the colors from the surrounding areas kind of showing through. So there are a couple of ways of going about it. Now I'm also using that brush here to work on some rocks. And I'm trying to ensure that these rocks are always diverse, always interesting. Much like our trees, they always need to be evolving. I don't ever want to do two that are the same. So I'm building them up with very, very similar geometric shapes, but I'm arranging them in different patterns. I'm also trying to ensure that much like the trees, the ones in the foreground are much larger and as we move into the background, they progressively get smaller and smaller. This means that I'm using less of the brush to apply them and I'm just trying to use the corners of the square headed brush to work on the ones in the far distance. Here we're going back to the front and so we're going to create a much larger one. You'll see as soon as my hand <laughs> leaves the frame. So this is really what the painting is going to look like around the 10 minute section. And I'm actually really happy with this. I love this. The goal is always to do it in 10 minutes. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. But with this painting, 
I had a couple of additional ideas, and I thought you would benefit from seeing where we took it. So I sped up the footage, and I hope that you enjoy the additional information that we share in this episode here today. But with that being said, I'm going to begin by just kind of throwing in some additional reflections in the middle of the water. And then I'm also going to go up and throw a sun into the sky, something bright, something to kind of bring it all together, something to ensure that the sky isn't lost within the vibrancy of the forest. And then I'm also going back in and adding in additional branches. Generally, the more of these you can incorporate, the more real it will look, but you don't want to overdo it. So it's all about finding that balance. With all of that being said, that is essentially our 10 to 11-ish minute painting. I truly hope you enjoyed and feel like you've learned something. If you'd like to learn more, there is a link in the description to my ebook, Acrylics for Beginners. And if you'd like lessons like this, but a little bit longer, around the hour long mark, where I also share with you my color palettes, how we're mixing our paints when we're using water, all of the things we don't have time for in these lessons, there is a link in the description to my Patreon where I do offer hour long lessons. If you sign up at the $4 level, you receive all of these lessons immediately and an additional hour-long lesson every month following that. If you sign up over there at the $8 level, you receive all of these hour-long painting lessons immediately and two additional lessons every month following that. With that being said, I'd like to thank you so much for watching. I post every Saturday. I hope to see you next Saturday. And above all, as always, stay creative.